Hello everyone. We've all had a headache at some point in our lives and most of the time it's no big deal. However, if the headache is so bad that the patient decides to seek medical assistance, we want to make sure that we don't miss a serious condition, one that would cause permanent damage or dysfunction of the brain. And broadly speaking, the conditions that we are worried about will fall into one of the following three categories. Number one, vascular accidents. This could either be vascular occlusion, so either arterial or venous occlusion, or hemorrhage. What kind of hemorrhage? Is it intraparenchymal hematoma, subdural, epidural? Whatever it is, intracranial bleeding is not good, right? The second category would be tumors, both primary tumors and metastases, because some of the most common cancers out there, like lung cancer, breast cancer, or melanoma, often metastasize into the central nervous system. And the third category would be central nervous system infections and inflammation. Now, of course, there are exceptions. There are potentially serious causes of headache that don't fall into any one of these categories. For example, your patient might have been exposed to certain toxins or drugs, but most of the time, the conditions that we are worried about will fall into one of these three categories. And in order to diagnose these conditions in time, we want to be on the lookout for the so-called red flags. Findings in our patient's history and physical examination that do suggest a potentially serious cause. And we need to actively seek them out because these red flags might not be obvious right away. So, okay, when the patient presents with a new headache, the first thing we need to do, just like with any acute condition, we want to observe our patient's overall appearance and we want to measure their vital signs, of course. And if the vital signs are significantly altered, well, it goes without saying, this is something serious. For example, blood pressure. Abnormally low blood pressure, so high potential, can cause a headache. But so can abnormally high blood pressure. In fact, a bad headache can be the first and only symptom of hypertensive crisis especially in patients who already have hypertension in pregnant women, for example, this could be the first and only symptom of preeclampsia. So always measure your patient's vital signs. It goes without saying. Next, we focus on the pain itself, on the headache itself. And just like any other pain anywhere else in the body, we need to flesh it out. We need to know its basic characteristics like how did it start and how severe is it? Did it start very abruptly or was the onset more gradual? In the literature, you will find how the so-called thunderclap headache often gets mentioned and you will find that it can be associated with some arachnoid hemorrhage. That is what everyone remembers. Fortunately for us, not every thunderclap headache is a symptom of subarachnoid hemorrhage. But every time we do hear about this very sudden onset of headache, of course we will suspect something serious, and yes, vascular accidents are our primary concern. Then of course severity, yes. If on the scale of 1 to 10, if your patient says that this is a 12, that this is the worst headache that they've ever had, it goes without saying, you will suspect a potentially serious cause. Now. Many patients have headaches, even severe headaches all the time. Many patients have migraine. But if your patient tells you that this headache is somehow different from the ones they experienced in the past, please take this very seriously. Patients who have headaches all the time, they are experts on their particular type of headache. Just because they have migraine all the time doesn't make them immune to certain very serious causes of headache like a stroke, meningitis or whatever. So always listen to your patients. Now, location of the pain is not necessarily a red flag. It can help you in reaching the right diagnosis. It can help you in figuring out the cause of the headache, but it's not a red flag in itself. However, if the headache is associated with significant neck pain or neck stiffness, this definitely is a red flag. When I say neck stiffness, the first thing that comes to mind is meningitis, right? It could be bacterial, viral meningitis, meningoencephalitis, so some kind of central nervous system infection. But there are also non-infectious causes that can present with a headache plus stiff neck, like I already mentioned, subarachnoid hemorrhage, right? Really, anything that irritates the meninges, anything that affects the subarachnoid space, can cause a headache and neck pain. I've seen several young patients with vertebral artery dissection and they presented with severe occipital headache plus 
significant neck pain. So once again, neck stiffness or neck pain that is associated with a headache, this is a red flag. Now that we know the basic characteristics of the headache, we want to know about the symptoms associated with this headache. And since the brain is our primary concern, the first thing we want to look for are signs of brain dysfunction. So first, altered level of consciousness. We want to make sure that we check both alertness and awareness. And there are a couple of things I would like you to remember here. Number one, the changes in the level of consciousness can be very subtle and please don't ignore them. Don't convince yourself that it's somehow normal for your patient to be kind of sleepy or kind of disoriented. Why would that be normal? That is not normal. I remember a patient, this was a 40-year-old woman with lupus, she was on corticosteroids, and she presented with a two-week-long headache, mild headache, but her family members noticed that she was kind of sleepy, kind of uptundered for the last couple of days. But when I asked her questions, every single time, she would give me the correct answer. She knew her address, she knew what date it was, everything. But there was a noticeable lag between my questions and her answers. It's like she always needed a couple of seconds to find the right words. And that is not normal. Why would a 40-year-old, highly educated woman with no history of psychiatric illness, with no history of dementia, need five seconds to remember her name or to remember her address? That is not normal. She had fungal meningitis. And that illustrates my point. The changes in the level of consciousness can be very subtle and please, if you find any, don't ignore them. Point number two, the level of consciousness can fluctuate. So your, your patient might seem fine right now, but they were completely disoriented or even unconscious a couple of hours ago, right? So if you have family members or caretakers present, ask them, did they notice anything out of the ordinary about the patient's behavior, about their reasoning? And if they do tell you that something was not normal, please take this very seriously and assess your patient's mental status more thoroughly, even if everything seems okay at first. Next, we need to look for focal abnormalities, focal neurological deficits. So we need to make sure that we at least do the basic neurologic exam. If we know what we are doing, this will only take a few minutes, but we have to do it. Sometimes this focal neurological deficit will be very obvious, but other times it won't. That is why we need to do the neurologic exam. And please pay especially close attention to the eyes. Ask your patient, did they experience blurred vision or double vision? Because all kinds of serious conditions can affect eyesight. So increased intracranial pressure can cause blur vision. It can cause double vision by causing compression to the nerves that control eye movement, right? It can cause asymmetry between the pupils, lack of reactivity between the pupils, right? Take a look at the visual pathway. Take a look at all the regions it crosses. It goes through half the brain, literally. So any abnormality along this pathway will cause vision problems. So make sure that you take your time to test your patient's visual acuity, eye movement, compare the pupils, and please don't forget the confrontational visual field test. That is what we often skip, but it can be highly significant. Again, look at the visual pathway. Any kind of abnormality, a tumor, a stroke, can affect it. It can lead to visual field defects. Time for another little story of mine. I remember a 60-year-old patient who was in a traffic accident, so he ran his car into a truck that was parked by the side of the road, and when he was taken to the ER, he was kind of shaken up and a little bit disoriented, so we thought, yeah, okay, the man was in an accident, it's normal for him to be a little bit shaken up, but when we examined him, when we did the neurological exam, we noticed that he had a visual field defect. We did a head CT scan and there it was, a small stroke right where it was supposed to be for him to have such a visual field defect. So he had a stroke while he was driving. That is why he ran into the truck that was parked in the first place. So he didn't even see it. He wasn't even aware that he had a visual field defect. And this serves to illustrate the point. Do at least the basic neurologic exam. Don't skip. Pay especially close attention to the eyes test visual acuity, compare the pupils, check eye movement, and do the basic confrontational test to test for visual field defects. 
Now, in the literature, you will always find how papal edema is a huge red flag because this can be a sign of increased intracranial pressure. And this is something that everyone seems to memorize every single time. When I ask my students, what would be the danger signs in a patient with a new headache? They always say papal edema right away. And yes, true enough, papal edema is potentially a very serious finding. And if you are good at fundoscopy, by all means, take a look and you will find papal edema from time to time. But for the rest of us who are not very skilled at fundoscopy, this is not a very useful clue. But don't despair. As you can see, there are plenty other red flags to choose from. So even without fundoscopy, you will do just fine. So let's recap. Altered level of consciousness, no matter how subtle, focal neurological deficit, including vision problems, this is all bad news and you should be looking for a serious condition. And once you've gone through all these red flags, ask yourself, who is my patient? Are they at any increased risk of having one of these conditions? So a stroke, hemorrhage, a tumor, or a central nervous system infection. The one thing that stands out is, are they immunocompromised? Because nowadays there are many people who take corticosteroids, all kinds of immunosuppressive drugs. There are many people who are organ transplant recipients, people with autoimmune diseases, people with HIV and AIDS, right? So all these people are at increased risk of so many infections that you would never even suspect in immunocompetent people. They're at risk of tumors, primary tumors, but also metastases. So if your patient is immunocompromised, you should be very careful. You should be paranoid, in fact. They can often present with deceivingly mild symptoms. Remember the patients from my first story, this 40-year-old woman with lupus? She presented with a two-week-long mild headache with subtle changes in the level of consciousness. And that is typical for immunocompromised patients. They will present with deceivingly mild symptoms and then they will suddenly crash. You don't want this to happen to you. So if you have an immunocompromised patient with no matter how subtle signs of brain dysfunction, low-grade headache, low-grade fever, you should suspect the worst. It's better to do a little bit too much than to miss a serious condition with immunocompromised patients. In the literature, you will find how age over 50 or over 60, depending on the source, is in itself the red flag and you can understand the logic behind that. Patients over 50 or 60, they often have all sorts of chronic conditions, which makes them more susceptible to vascular accidents, tumors, but also infections. In other words, everything that we are worried about when someone presents with an acute headache. So yes, it makes sense that age over 60 would be classified as a red flag. And finally, since I mentioned chronic conditions, always ask yourself, uh, I mean, ask the patient, what kind of medications do they take on a regular basis? And here what stands out for me would be anticoagulants. In the literature, you will find that all sorts of drugs can be associated with all sorts of headaches, okay? But anticoagulants, I feel, are especially relevant because there are many elderly patients on all kinds of anticoagulants. And the thing is, and elderly, frail patients, they often fall, they can hit their head and... After seemingly mild trauma, they can end up with serious intracranial pathology, serious intracranial hemorrhage. So this is the typical scenario. An elderly person who is on anticoagulants falls, they hit their head, they seem okay at first, but after a couple of hours or days even, suddenly they develop this severe headache or altered level of consciousness, right? And in that case, you have to suspect the worst you have to do at least a head CT scan to look for signs of intracranial hemorrhage. Please remember that a new onset headache in a patient who is on anticoagulants is in itself a red flag. Now, you might be surprised how as an infectious diseases specialist, I still didn't mention fever as a red flag in patients who present with a headache. And well, fever is, let's say, a red flag. But the thing is, there are many patients with acute pyelonephritis, so a urinary tract infection, with pneumonia, with influenza for that matter, who will have a headache. And of course, you will not suspect a central nervous system infection every single time you see a patient with fever and a headache. However, if this headache is especially severe, or if it is the dominant symptom, or 
if it involves one of the red flags that we covered in this lecture, you will seriously consider a central nervous system infection. And in that case, you need to do a spinal tap with CSF analysis. This is the only way to reliably exclude or confirm a central nervous system infection. So if the spinal tap is indicated, don't skip it. Don't be afraid to do it. Many doctors are afraid to do it because probably they are not experienced with it. And if you are one of these doctors, that's okay. Call a more senior physician who will do it. The point is, don't be reluctant and don't ignore, don't skip spinal tap when it's indicated. Thank you for watching. If you want to learn how to suspect and diagnose serious infections early, including sepsis, I suggest you take a look at my free online course that I prepared for you. You will find the link in the description of this video. There I teach things that I wish someone had taught me before I even started out. Thank you for watching. Good luck out there and take care.